Why is it so hard for women around the world to give birth? Why are things like sickle cell disease and lactose intolerance more common in some parts of the world than in others? Why is it so incredibly easy for us to gain weight? Along with many of my medical school classmates, I have often wondered aloud about questions like these. My professor's stock answer? Evolution. That may fit on a bumper sticker, but it's not enough to address the complexities of human life encoded in just that one word. Why? However, a field of scientific study is emerging that focuses on finding answers to the questions I just asked and others that have avoided easy answers. It's not taught at many universities or medical schools, and many physicians would be hard-pressed to describe anything about it. Yet, it holds the potential to improve our health and eradicate many of the diseases that plague us today. That field is evolutionary medicine. It links the processes revealed by Darwin in the 19th century to address 21st century questions in medicine. It will only take me a few minutes to explain what evolutionary medicine is and why we should care about it in this opening episode. In future episodes, we will cover current applications and explore future possibilities and directions for the field. My name is Florence Yuan, and this is Darwin MD. So what is evolutionary medicine anyway? Evolutionary medicine, also known as Darwinian medicine, is a field of study that examines human health and disease using evolutionary principles and the evolutionary history of humans as a species. The field formally emerged in the early 1990s, and scientists commonly credited as its founders are George Williams, Randolph Ness, and Stephen Stearns. Medicine is generally studied and taught from a molecular and physiological point of view, looking at the microscopic mechanisms of how cells and signals and hormones and genes all interact to make our bodies function or cause disease. These close-up descriptions of biochemical processes are known as proximate causes or explanations, and these explanations are important, but they don't tell the whole story. This is where evolutionary medicine comes in. Evolutionary medicine, or EvoMed as I like to call it, aims to determine what are known as the ultimate causes of health and disease. Rather than looking at the immediate mechanisms behind a characteristic or process, ultimate causes look at the broader and higher level reasons why something happens the way it does. In the case of evolutionary medicine, that usually involves looking at the history of the human species, its primate relatives, and other organisms important in human evolution. After hearing this, you might be thinking, if evolutionary medicine bases its conclusions on millions of years of evolutionary history, how is it supposed to be relevant to a regular person like me? That's a great question, and probably one of the reasons why EvoMed isn't as well known as it should be. At first glance, it doesn't seem applicable to the average person. This whole series aims to prove that idea wrong, but I'll start by listing just a few examples of how EvoMed is relevant to people like you and me. Evolutionary medicine can show how many of the chronic diseases we have today result from culture changing much more rapidly than biology can evolve. For example, EvoMed can inform the discussion about obesity and type 2 diabetes, both of which have become global epidemics as high sugar and high fat foods have become plentiful. We can use the evidence EvoMed gives us to debunk the paleo diet and figure out what kinds of foods we should actually eat. EvoMed can also reshape the way we look at certain human characteristics. For example, the ability to digest milk in adulthood, commonly seen in the Western world as normal, actually evolved from genetic mutations in certain European and African populations in response to cattle domestication. This means that those of you who are lactose intolerant may actually be the normal ones. One of the topics where EvoMed truly shines is in childbirth and parenting. Evolutionary medicine can inform parents' decisions about when and how to give birth, what medical and non-medical support tools are most beneficial for both mother and newborn, how to prevent allergies and other diseases, and so on. These are only a few of the many ways that evolutionary medicine contributes to scientific knowledge and can help us throughout our lives. These topics and others will be the focus of future episodes. As with any science, evolutionary medicine comes with its own language, so to speak, of terms that define and describe key concepts in the field. It's important to establish the definitions of these terms in order to have a foundation for what we will be talking about. Let's start with perhaps the most central concept in evolutionary medicine, evolution. Evolution can be defined as changes in the inherited characteristics of organism populations over time. Such changes are maintained by a process first described by Charles Darwin called natural selection, in which organisms better suited to their environment are more likely to survive, reproduce, and pass on those adaptations to their offspring. Two terms that are crucial to understand for evolutionary medicine are the concepts of trade-offs and mismatches. Evolution deals in trade-offs, where a benefit in one area or during a particular period of an organism's life can often lead to some sort of harm or disadvantage in another area or time of life. For example, the evolution of cells to optimize growth and survival through early reproduction 
may lead to cancer later in life, when that growth continues after reproductive age. EvoMed also commonly focuses on mismatches, where adaptations designed for one environment become irrelevant or even maladaptive in a new and different environment. For example, the rapid increase in the incidence of allergies and autoimmune diseases in recent decades may come from us excessively sanitizing our environments and getting rid of microbes that are actually important for the development of our immune systems. A lot of the terms I just talked about require a little more context than I can provide in this series. A basic understanding of research design, genetics, biostatistics, and cell biology can be helpful to more deeply understand what we will be talking about. Let's look ahead now to some of what's to come in future episodes. We'll be structuring each episode around clinical cases, since they allow us to learn about broader concepts in evolutionary medicine through the lens of individual patients' stories. You'll hear about a patient who presents to you with a particular condition, and then I'll give you the background information about evolutionary medicine that you need to properly evaluate the case. This is how medical students and doctors across the U.S. learn about various diseases and how to treat them. The process of thinking through the reasons for a specific diagnosis is part of what makes medicine so interesting and exciting. I hope you're looking forward to it. See you in the next episode.